We are near the spot where what President George W. Bush called the first counteroffensive on the War of Terror came to an end. Yes, behind us, right over here, is the Tower of Voices. You'll notice there are 40 different openings in this tower. That represents each of the 40 heroes from that day. There were 33 passengers, there were two pilots, and there were five crew members on that flight. United Airlines, Flight 93. It was supposed to go from New Jersey all the way out to San Francisco. It didn't make it there. It ended up in a field nearby. We're gonna tell you more about the heroes, true American heroes of that flight. We're gonna show you the memorial and we're gonna show you the crash site and we cordially invite you to come along. Come along. On September 11th, 2001, passengers boarded Flight 93 on time. However, when they were all getting ready to take off, they were delayed by 42 minutes. That's right, it was at Newark International Airport in New Jersey. It was a beautiful day, similar to today. The skies were clear. You could see for miles away, they could see the New York skyline beautifully off in the distance. They actually got away from their terminal, from their gate, it was gate 17, terminal A, on time, eight o'clock in the morning, but then they had to sit for just over 40 minutes once they got out onto the runway. Now this delay, of course, helped out a lot later as far as stopping this plane from crashing into the Capitol building, which was probably the goal here, maybe the White House. No one knows for sure. A monumental 93 foot tall musical instrument. The music of the chimes is a living tribute to these 40 men and women, many whose last messages to loved ones were through telephone calls and recorded voice messages. The Tower of Voices chimes are activated solely by the wind. This granite pathway represents the path that Flight 93 took. That's right, it would have flown right through here, this beautiful area, and coming through here. Of course, by now, the passengers, the heroes of that flight, had actually taken a vote already. We find this interesting because it was democracy at work. Here you had terrorists on their very airplane, and they took a vote. The definition, kind of, of democracy, taking that vote, deciding what they wanted to do. They took a vote, decided they were going to overtake the cockpit of this plane and try to stop this from happening. So here, apparently, some of the passengers had actually gotten into the cockpit by the time they were flying over here. The plane was weaving left and right. It actually flipped upside down at one point and continued the flight straight through this area here. Along the path, the times of the three planes which crashed at other places are inscribed. 8.46, 30 a.m., One World Trade Center, American Airlines Flight 11. 9.03.02 a.m., Two World Trade Center, United Airlines Flight 175. 9.37.46 a.m., Pentagon, American Airlines Flight 77. The concrete walls are here to narrow our focus on what lies ahead. Also, the texture on the walls is made to look like the texture of a hemlock tree, since the plane crashed into a hemlock grove. The path ends with an overlook area where you can look down at the crash site. On the glass is written, a common field one day, a field of honor forever. Straight ahead is where the crash occurred. The boulder that's located behind us is almost the exact spot where the plane crashed. That's right, it created a crater that was 30 feet deep and 15 feet wide at the site of the crash because they couldn't find many of the remains of the people. That's why they ended up enclosing that area, enclosing that crater with dirt that became the burial spot for the heroes of Flight 93. Some people have left mementos behind as close as they could get to the crash site. Those gates right there take you to the rock that is where the memorial is at. However, only family members are allowed on sacred ground. It's the sacred ground where the plane actually crashed. Over here is the wall of names. It's a white marble wall. As we walk down, we want to tell you about some of the heroes of that day. First, starting right here, Todd M. Beamer. Now, Todd Beamer called. There were phones on the back of the seats on the plane. He made a call that put through to a Verizon representative where he started talking to her about what was happening. They recited the Lord's Prayer together and then they said Psalm 23. He also began plotting out what he was going to do with the other passengers. He's the one that said, let's roll. 
Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The next person we want to talk about is Cece Ross Lyle. She was a flight attendant who went to the back of the plane and got pitchers of hot water to throw on the terrace. Her husband was a police officer down in Fort Myers, Florida. Now she called him, he was in the shower, he didn't get the call. Actually, he didn't hear the message until about two weeks later that she had left where she said, baby, you have to listen to me carefully. I'm on a plane that's been hijacked. I'm on the plane, I'm calling from the plane. I want to tell you that I love you. Please tell my children that I love them very much and I'm so sorry, babe. Um, I don't know what to say, there's three guys. They've hijacked the plane, I'm trying to be calm. We've turned around and I've heard that there's planes that's been, been flown into the World Trade Center. I hope to be able to see your face again, baby. I love you, goodbye. Her voice was breaking as she ended the message, which again, he heard a couple weeks later. This brought some jurors to tears when this was in testimony at a later trial. Pilot Captain Jason Dahl actually wasn't supposed to be on the flight at all. However, he traded flights with another pilot. That's right, he wanted to get back to Colorado early because he was supposed to be heading out with his wife to London. That was for their anniversary. Flight attendant Deborah Welsh was actually not supposed to be on that flight either. Yeah, she had traded schedules with another flight attendant to help the other flight attendant out. She actually didn't even like early morning flights. John Talignani's stepson, Alan, died on September 6th, 2001. He was in California on his honeymoon when his vehicle had a head-on collision with a truck. His new bride survived with a broken chin and shoulder, along with crushed knees. John was on Flight 93 to go to Allen's memorial service. John had been a bartender at the Palm Restaurant in New York for 20 years. Lauren Gran Coles was three months pregnant at the time of her death. Her baby, for some reason, is not included in the number of deaths, but her memorial does have an unborn child included on it. She was writing a self-help book for women when she died. Her sisters were able to get her book called You Can Do It, the Merit Badge Handbook for Grown-Up Girls, published in 2015. Jeremy Glick was scheduled to leave on a business trip to California on September 10th. He wasn't looking forward to the trip as he had a 12-week-old daughter at home, so he pushed it back one day and ended up on Flight 93. His wife Liz said, I think it was the morning after Jeremy died. I remember looking down at Emerson and she was sleeping and just crying because she would never know her father. And then I thought she would only know a sad mom. So she decided to pull herself together for the sake of their daughter. Mark Bingham was the final passenger to board Flight 93 because he had overslept his alarm clock in the morning. He was a former rugby player and was part of a group of what Jeremy Glick called four big guys who came up with the plan to storm the cockpit. He called his mom, left a message saying he loved her. Then he got up from his seat in first class to help begin the assault on the cockpit door. On September 14, 2001, Billy Graham gave a heartfelt speech to the nation about the attack. We're gonna quote some of that speech to you as we close out this video. There is hope for the future because of God's promises. As a Christian, I have hope, not just for this life, but for heaven and the life to come. And many of those people who died this past week are in heaven now, and they wouldn't want to come back. It's so glorious and so wonderful. That is the hope for all of us who put our faith in God. I pray that you will have this hope in your heart. This event reminds us of the brevity and the uncertainty of life. We never know when we too will be called into eternity. I doubt if those people who got on those planes or walked into the World Trade Center or the Pentagon on Tuesday thought it would be the last day of their lives. And that's why we must face our own spiritual need and commit ourselves to God and His will.